let's worship him and praise him. Oh, that's right. Let's worship his name. He's worthy to be praised. If you believe he's more than enough, give him a great praise tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, he's worthy. Lord, we worship you. We praise you. We magnify you. We glorify you. We lift you up. Hallelujah. Amen. I think of God that is a more than enough God. When we feel like we praise him enough, we ought to praise him more than enough, don't you think? So why don't we give him praise one more time this evening? Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, I feel his presence in this place tonight. Oh, that's right, praise him. Praise is your key to unlock the door for everything you need from him. What if how you praise him right now determine the size of your miracle? Hey, hallelujah! Oh, yes! What if your praise determine your breakthrough? What if your praise determine your miracle? Enter to his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Oh, yes, turn with me to the book of 2 Timothy chapter number 2. To all of our guests, we're so thankful you're here. Amen. We're so glad that you've come. Can you make our guests welcome to Bethlehem tonight? Thank you for coming here. Amen. Thank you for coming. And all those who are watching online, thank you for being a part of this service and for being part of our Bethlehem Church family. Amen. You are not just joining any old building in any old place, but you are in an apostolic environment. That means we preach and teach the apostles' doctrine. That's repentance, water baptism in Jesus' name, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. It's the greatest thing that will ever happen in your life. Amen. The best thing ever happened to me is when I was born again the Bible way. Do I have a witness in the house tonight? Amen. 2 Timothy chapter number 2. Remember our midweek services at 715. Bible classes for all ages, for all of our new members. I cannot stress to you how important it is for you to be here Wednesday night for grow classes we have found that people that come to First Steps, grow class, and get in a life group, they make it. God does miracles in their lives, and it works, and we want you to be a part of that. Second Timothy chapter number 2, in verse number 15 through 22, if you found it, say amen. amen. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth but shun profane and vain babblings for they will increase unto more ungodliness and their word will eat as doth a canker of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus who concerning the truth have erred saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth and some to honor and some to dis dishonor if a man therefore purge himself from these he shall be a vessel unto honor sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work flee also youthful lusts but follow righteousness faith charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. 
I want to preach for a while this evening the keys to a great house. Anybody remember that first house you bought and you signed your name on that line and you got your keys to your first house? Remember that? Amen. I want to preach tonight about the keys to a great house. Lord, I pray, anoint me to preach, anoint ears to hear, confirm your word with signs following. Let the anointing destroy every yoke. Do a work of the Holy Ghost in this place. God, in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise as you're being seated tonight. God bless you. For every young couple, the day that you get the keys to your own house is a big deal. I remember the day that Sister V and I closed on our first little house in Indiana. There was such a sense of excitement when that real estate agent put those keys into our hand. We had bought an older home that needed some work. We painted, redid cabinets, laid tile. When we got done, the house on the inside looked almost new. It was small, but it was nice. But you know how long that house stayed looking new? Just as long as it took us to walk in from outside. A house that's lived in gets scuffs and dirt and dust in it. Can somebody say amen. amen. But even as the house begins to look lived in, real estate almost always gains in value, not loses value. Even when a house is no longer in perfect condition, it actually gains value, not loses value. The second chapter of Timothy, chapter of sec the second chapter of 2 Timothy is a chapter of instruction to all who would desire to work in the kingdom of God. Truthfully, I could have included the entire chapter more truthfully, I could have included the entire book of 2 Timothy, and it would have been relevant and germane to the subject we have at hand tonight. I believe that everyone who is spirit-filled and spirit-led has an inward drive for greatness. I'm going to say that again. Everyone, thank you, sis, Everyone who is spirit-filled and spirit-led has an inward drive for greatness. God is not an average, ordinary God. Nowhere has God ever laid claim to mediocrity. It is not in God's nature at all to inspire ordinary, average, mediocre, common, run-of-the-mill, pedestrian, middle living. God's call is a call to greatness. Praise God. Jesus Christ did not come so we could always be one breath away from disaster. He was not born beaten and crucified so we could always be on the edge of an emotional collapse. Jesus said the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Amen. God's call tonight is a call to more abundant living. Many years ago, I preached a message titled An Enemy Called Average. And in that message, I talked about how the desire to just be ordinary is the enemy of the church and the Christian. And may I tell you, after all these years, that average is still the enemy of the child of God. The enemy wants you to be satisfied with where you are spiritually. Amen. Can I tell you that if you have the inclination tonight to just push this message off and say, I think I'm all right just like I am, you are already a victim to the enemy called average. You have been slain by, spiritually by that enemy. The enemy wants you to be satisfied with where you are. Average wants you to be satisfied with the status quo in your spiritual life. Average wants you to be satisfied 
with spiritual stagnation. Average wants you to be satisfied existing on a church pew, not doing anything for God. The enemy called average wants this service to be just ordinary, average, and usual. May I tell you that the enemy is okay with you getting a little excited in church as long as you go home tonight and go back to life as ordinary and usual. The enemy doesn't mind you shouting a little bit on Sunday night as long as you go back to sinful living on Monday morning. The enemy is all right with you talking in tongues in church as long as you still talk carnal and worldly at work and school. You have to say amen, but I know I'm preaching good right now. Average is okay with you not doing anything extra. Don't give any more effort to God. Don't try any harder. Don't dream any dreams. Just be ordinary, average. Just be middle of the road. Just be ordinary in your life with God. May I tell you that we have been programmed to be negative, to disbelieve, to be skeptical. May I tell you that the accomplices of the enemy called average is complacency, satisfaction, apathy, and indifference. Complacency says, just take it easy. Satisfaction says, I'm fine just like I am. Apathy says, I don't really care if I get more or not. And indifference says, I'm not going to let this message change me. I'll do what I want to do. But you have to understand that a great God a great, mighty, awesome God would never call his church to be something different in nature than what he is. A great God wouldn't call an ordinary church. A great God wouldn't call an average church. A great God wouldn't be satisfied with a mediocre church. So if we have a great God, that means God wants his church to be great. Oh, yes, Lord. May I tell you that the call on the church in this day and hour is to break out of ordinary average living and reach for the stars in the spirit. Amen. There is pressure in this world for the church just to be watered down, weak and ordinary. Just go through the motions. Just be like every place else and do what everybody else does. But that is not the call of God on Bethlehem Church, and I refuse to be satisfied with average, ordinary, mediocre, run-of-the-mill. God has called this to be a great house. God has called this to be a great place of deliverance. God has called this to be a great place of anointing. God has called this to be a place of great praise. God has called this to be a place of great Holy Ghost power. And may I tell you, can I cut a little bit ahead? And can I tell you that this building itself, this church has no ability to be great at all. It's just wood. It's just carpet. It's just paint. It's just sheetrock. If this church is going to be great, that means God has called you to greatness. So somebody ought to just rejoice for a minute because God has not called you to just be another ordinary individual. God has called you personally. God's called you to great things. God's called you to great things. God's called you to great things. I'm trying to get this in your spirit. God has called you to greatness. We live in a world of insults. This crazy world has no idea how to be funny. Amen. I'm trying not to get sidetracked on a pet peeve, but can I just tell you that in the present world, if you want to be funny, you have to be perverted or you got to be insulting. But I'm telling you, God wants you to be great. So I want you to look at somebody and tell them, you're great. Look at somebody else, tell them, you're great. Everybody point up here and say, you're great. I got you, didn't I? God is great, and God wants his church to be great. You must understand that a great God would never call his church to be something different than what he is. If he is great, he wants his church to be great. If he wants his church to be great, that means he wants his people to be great. That means that you have greatness inside of you. It may not be manifested all the time. It may have struggles in the world every so often, but I'm telling you there's greatness inside of you. There's power inside of you. There's calling and anointing inside of you. This is a great house because God's got greatness for his people. It's not by any work of righteousness which we have done, but it's by his grace. God has chosen to pick you up out of sin. 
God has chosen to pick you up out of perdition. God has chosen to pick you up out of your mess. And if God picked you up, he picked you up to put greatness in you. Oh, God, I wish somebody would praise him right now. I wish somebody struggling right now would just give God praise because you just got a promise that there's something inside of you that can overcome your addiction. It can overcome your temptation. It can overcome your past. It can overcome your family tree. It can overcome. You ought to praise God right now because what you just heard is a promise from God that there's better things for you. The call on the church is to break out of ordinary and average. And so in our text, Paul is trying to push Timothy, his understudy, to another level. He knows that Timothy was not called to be average, ordinary, and mediocre. So he's challenging Timothy for greatness. Some of us like patted on the back. We don't like to be challenged. We want to be coddled, but not confronted. We want to be babied, but not prodded. But Paul refused to let Timothy become complacent. So Paul was constantly pushing Timothy to go deeper, to go further, to go higher, to go for great. He would not allow Timothy to be satisfied with just an ordinary average ministry. So he kept pushing Timothy to another level. He kept calling Timothy to another place. In 2 Timothy 2 and 15, he challenged him to learn, study, to show thyself approved unto God. Now look, I realize I may have got all the amens I'm going to get for the rest of the night. We're getting ready to do some work here, okay? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. When I know that people are not trying to learn more from the Bible, I know they don't care about being great. When people don't like preaching and they don't like Bible study, they don't like coming to church, I understand that person does not want to be great. I've come to understand that I can't really help people who don't want to learn. Amen. Because if you want to be great, you can't get enough of the Word of God. When I see people who rarely or never come to Wednesday night, I know they're not interested in being great. When I see Sunday only, and it's not because you have to be somewhere else, I understand they don't want to be great. They're satisfied with average, ordinary, mediocre. They're not difference makers. They're not world changers. They're not ready for greatness. But if they ever get in love with the Word of God and they ever get in love with the house of God, they'll reach a level that they can't reach any other way. And so Paul said, Timothy, you got to study. You got to get yourself in the Bible. You got to get yourself in the Word of God. And may I tell you, the first key to your greatness is you got to fall in love with this leather bound book. You got to get in the pages of this Bible. You got to get this in your spirit. Hello, I'm preaching old time Pentecost right now. Read your Bible every day. Read your Bible every day. Read your Bible every day and you'll grow, grow, grow. If you want to be great, you got to fall in love with this book. This book is the key to life. This book is the key to victory. This book is the key to deliverance. This book is the key to greatness. And then from that verse, verses 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21 are all about living holy. 2 Timothy 2 and 16, shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. He says, don't waste your time on things that are profane and vain. Profane means unholy. Vain means unimportant. He said, if you really want to be great, you can't waste your time on things that are unholy and unimportant. You can't let your life become encumbered with things that are not holy. And you can't let your life become encumbered by things that are unimportant. And when I watch people give all their energy to things that don't matter. Amen. That don't matter one little bit in eternity. When I see people give their lives to things and they miss church for habits and hobbies that don't have anything to do with salvation, I realize that person has given themselves to profane and vain babblings. Amen. Am I preaching the word? Am I in the book? Bishop, if I get out of the book, you let me know. But I'm in the book right now. We got to train ourselves to not waste time. Don't waste your brain power on every song on the radio and not be interested in worshiping God. You've embraced profane and vain. If you give more time to hobbies than you do to godly things, you've embraced profane and vain. When you know every sports score, but you don't know your Bible, you've embraced, can I preach to you for a minute? 
Let me ask you right. Why don't we just go ahead and cut to it right now? Do you want to be baby denied or do you want to be preached to? Do you want to be preached to or you want to be patted on the back and sent home like a good little baby with a sucker in your mouth? Or do you want the word of God preached to you tonight? I'm telling you, we waste so much time on stuff that doesn't matter. We waste so much of our life on things that are unimportant and unholy. But Paul said, Timothy, if you want to be great, you got to shun those things. you got to get that stuff out of your life. A child of God doesn't have time to memorize every song on the radio. A child of God doesn't have time to memorize every detail about every perverted Hollywood star that been burped out of hell. A child of God doesn't have time to waste on profane and vain stuff. Somebody say, praise the Lord. It's not going to get better, folks. This might be your exit. You cannot give most of your time to things that are unholy and unimportant and expect to be great in the kingdom of God. Greatness requires you to filter your life. I said greatness requires you to filter your life. God doesn't want you to be a robot, but he also doesn't want you to be so encumbered by carnal, worldly things that you can't accomplish anything for him. And then Paul took it a step further. Say, uh uh-oh. 2 Timothy 2.17, and their word will eat as doth a canker. The word canker there means gangrene. It's an infection that goes through the, through the, the skin and the muscle all the way to the bone. He said, if you let that stuff get in you, it's not just going to stay on the surface. It's not going to be just a little surface. He said, it's going to eat all the way to the bone. It's going to get all the way to the deep part inside of you. He said, their word will eat at the canker of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. Paul was an old-time pastor. He done, he done called them out from the pulpit. I know, I know this is new, and a lot of our new folks, you have no concept of this, but in the days when I was growing up, it was nothing to get your name called out. If you was goofing off during church chit-chatting, the pastor would call your name out over the pulpit, and you know what? Mommy and Daddy didn't pat you on the back and say, it's okay, Johnny, everything's all right. They said, my God, son, quit talking. If you weren't talking, he wouldn't have had to call you out. He done called him out from the pulpit. Paul said, Timothy, you don't be like Hymenaeus and Philetus over there. He said, they're like a gangrene. They'll eat you to the bone. They'll destroy you. I'm going to tell you right now that if you really want to be great, there's some people you got to get out of your life. Am I freaking all right? I said, if you really want to be great, sometimes you got to say, I love you, but I ain't got time for you. I love you, but I'm not going to let you ruin my spirit. I love you, but you're not going to take me out of the house of God. I love you and all that, but you're not going to get me away from the presence of God. Sometimes you got to learn to tell people no. Hey, if grandma shows up at church time, it's grandma come to church with me or sit here till I get back, but I'm going to the house of God. And I don't know why every family reunion is on Sunday. My God, have your family reunion on Saturday and get to the house of God like you're supposed to. He said, look, don't you be like Hymenaeus and Philetus. Don't you be like those guys. Here is the inconvenient truth of greatness. You have to start filtering out who has access to your life. Mm. Praise God. We believe in being kind, friendly, and welcoming to anyone who needs God. But, and we, we don't believe in shunning people. We don't believe in cutting people off. We don't believe in, 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 in being rude to people. We don't believe any of that. And you know that's not at all what I'm talking about. But you have got to learn to guard your time and connections with people. You've got to learn. You've got to learn that some people don't have access to your mind and your spirit and your time. Amen. If there are people in your life who are driving you away from God, be nice to them. Be kind to them. But do not give them access to your spirit. 
If you got somebody in your life that's always critical about the church and always critical about what you, how we live, you got to get some space from that person. I ain't got time. Look, I'm trying to be great. I'm not trying to be average, ordinary Joe Blow from Kokomo. I'm not trying to be a, average, ordinary nobody. I want greatness in my life. So that sometimes requires me saying, I love you, but get away. I know what you're thinking. That's only three verses. He read a lot more. You cannot be too connected to people that are not part of your God-given destiny. Can I take it a step further and say your relationships say who you are? Can I take it further and say you can't fly with eagles if you hang out with turkeys? At some point, at some point, you got to shut down access to your life and say, I was called for more than that. I'm called for more than just being a Sunday churchgoer and not doing anything for God. I'm called for more than just being a pew sitter. You might be happy living like you are, but I got greatness in me. And it's time for me to cut some lies. And Paul goes on. 2 Timothy 2.19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth, standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. The Lord knoweth them that are his. You might fool your parents. You might fool your pastor. You might fool your spouse. You might fool your friends. But the Lord knows them that are his. You can't fool God. What's done is secret is seen by the eyes of God. The Lord knows them that are his. Might as well take off the pretty face. Might as well take off the, take off the mask. Might as well quit playing church and just say, God, you know what I really am. You know how bad I need you, God. I'm coming after you tonight because I believe I got greatness. I may not have lived it up to now. I may not have been it till now. But, God, I believe there's greatness in me because you sent that preacher to tell me that I can be great. So now I understand, God, I can't fool you, so I'm coming to you. Amen, I'm not interested in playing church. I'm not interested in patty cake. I'm not interested in putting on a show when I come to the house of God. God, you know if I'm yours or not, so help me to live it every day of my life. You should have a church wardrobe and a school wardrobe. You should have a church style and a work style. You ought to live godly every day because the Lord knows them that are his. He sees you Monday morning, Tuesday afternoon, Thursday night, Friday all day, and Saturday too. The Lord knows them that are his. The Lord knows them that are his. The Lord knows if we're serving him. So my God, let's get with it. And let's be great in the kingdom of God. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Everybody say depart. Depart means to withdraw, remove, revolt to desert, to flee from, to cease, to withdraw oneself from. He said, let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. I am so sick of modern, watered-down, baby Christianity. That ain't no difference from the world. He said, if you're going to call me your Christ, then you get out of sin. Don't say you're a Christian and then live like the world. Don't say you're a Christian. Don't name the name of Christ and then curse and drink and smoke and cuss and drug it up all weekend. He said, don't name the name of Christ. Then look like the world, talk like the world, act like the world. He said, if you're going to say you're a Christian, then get out of sin and quit doing it. Is this too strong? Is this too strong for 2021? Do we still have a stomach for real Bible preaching? Or we had all, had, do we got to be babied or can we hear what the Bible says? He said, if you're going to call yourself a Christian, then live like a Christian. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. You got to make life changes, folks. It's the key to greatness. You got to make life changes. You can't just be a Christian at church. You have to leave sin. I get concerned when I see people go so far in Christ and then come to a standstill and refuse to go any further. 
I'll do this, this, and this, but this is where my line is. I'm not going to do that. Listen, sin doesn't knock the door down. Sin creeps in unaware. Sin doesn't knock your door down. Sin creeps in unaware. Skirts creep up. Splits creep up. Necklines creep down. Sleeves creep shorter. Hair starts creeping up on a woman and her hair starts creeping down on a man. Is this too strong preaching for you? Makeup creeps in. Clear polish creeps in. Jewelry creeps in. But when you name the name of Christ, depart from it. If you're going to be a Christian, let's live it. This generation needs an old-time apostolic church. This generation needs a holiness church. You're not going to fight hell. You're not going to fight the demons of this generation and be watered down by the word. My God, let's get with it. There's some people in this place that used to live holy and you let stuff creep in. It's time to get lined up with the word of God. Get right and do it. It's a key to greatness. Come on, daddies, go home and clean out your daughter's makeup drawer. She shouldn't have it anyway. Come on, ladies, get that junk off your hands. Come on, men, let's be men, and let's live for God. It's a key to greatness. You can't be great and be compromised with the world. I know, I know, I know, I know this generation doesn't like it, but I've got to preach what the Word of God says. When you name the name of Christ, depart from it. There's a call. The call to greatness is a call to holiness. You cannot be great for God and be worldly and carnal at the same time. Verse 21 advances the point. 2 Timothy 2, 21, If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor. If, everybody say if. If a man purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified. Hallelujah. Meat for the master's use. Amen. You can't be meat for the master's use if you're still encumbered by the things of this life. He said, and prepared to every good work. The call to greatness demands preparation on our part. He said, purge. Everybody say, purge. It means to clean thoroughly, to cleanse. The call in this hour is not less holy living because the world has less. The call this hour is more holy living because the world needs to see the difference. People are walking out of churches by the millions. Churches are shutting down every day. Denominations are in crisis. Because the world doesn't see any difference between their church and their world. But when they walk into Bethlehem, my God, let there be a difference in this place. Purge yourself from the world. Can I, can I preach just a little bit more? Can I tell you one more thing? Can I, can I point out a word? If a man therefore purge himself, who? You mean God doesn't have the responsibility to take stuff off of you that you put on you? Am I all right? He said, purge himself. Well, if God, if God will do this, look, God didn't give it to you. God don't have to take it away. At some point, you got to man up and say, I'm getting that out of my life. I'm not going there. I'm not doing that. I've changed my ways. I'm not living that way anymore. If I never, if I, if God never touches me about it, I'm going to purge my, I'm going to take responsibility for my life. Come on, somebody. You got to take responsibility and get that junk out of your life. If a man purge, God's not going to have to do it. You got to do it yourself. Whew. Lord Jesus, I'm tired. If you'll filter the people who cause division, discord out of your life, those who encourage you to live sinfully and worldly, you can be sanctified, holy meat for the master's use. God, I want you to be able to use me. God, I want to be useful in the kingdom. I want my life to mean something. 
I don't want to just show up to church over and over and over and my life never mean anything. I want to be useful, God. I don't want to be useful to the, I don't want to be more useful to the devil than I am to you, God. I want to be prepared to every good work. I want to put, I want to put my effort into being ready when you call me, God. Work means doing something. God never called anybody to just sit and do nothing. Everybody in this place ought to find something to do in the kingdom of God. Every good work. Work means you got to do something. God never called anybody just to sit on a pew. God never called people just to observe. God calls people to work. When you got the Holy Ghost, you got a job application, brother. When you got baptized, you got a job application, sister. God called us to work in the kingdom of God. This idea that I could just show up, sit on a pew, clap my hands a couple times, and go home is a lie from hell. God calls people to work. Well, I didn't think I'd get a lot of amens there. It just makes me want to preach it more. God called you to do something, brother. God called you to do something, sis. Let's find something. If it's just picking up paper off the floor, God, I got to do something because you called me to work. Mm, I wish somebody would say praise the Lord. I'm starting to get even more stirred up. Paul's not through with Timothy. I wonder if Timothy felt like maybe he needed a break, but Paul wasn't through with him. Verse 22, flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that, are, that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Flee also youthful lusts. Lust. Brothers and sisters, this is a lustful world. Everything in the world is about desire. Desire for things, desire for stuff, desire for the gratification of the flesh. This world revolves around two things, sex and money. I said the S word, and then I said the M word, the two worst words you can say. This world revolves around sex and money. Let me tell you, if it's not for sale, don't show it. And save it for the person that's going to walk down the aisle with you. Paul said, you got to flee. You got to flee youthful lust. The word flee means to run away from. Seek, it means to seek safety, to escape. You can't play with lust and be great for God. Well, praise God. I said you can't play with lust and be great for God. Sex was made for marriage. I don't care what Hollywood says. I don't care what the world says. I don't care what modern society says. Sex was made for marriage. And when you do it outside of marriage, you're robbing your future spouse of something. That belong to them and them only. Am I preaching yet? Don't dabble in it. Don't participate in it. Don't talk about it. It's for the marriage covenant. Lust has been the ruin of many good people. Here's what Proverbs 7, 26 and 27 said about the spirit of lust. She has cast down many wounded. Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. You don't believe that? Ask Samson. Her house is the way to hell. I'm talking about the spirit of lust that permeates this world. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. Unless you want to die spiritually and go to hell, you got to run from lust. You got to run from lust. Don't put yourself in a situation that makes it easy to fall. My God, I wish I, I figured every mom and dad in this place would be practically standing on your head right now. That might be part of the problem. Do we still believe it or do we not believe it? Is it in the Bible or is it not in the Bible? You gotta run from it. You gotta run from it. You gotta run from it. When the world's running towards it, it's a good indicator. You better run from it. I said, when the world's running towards it, it's a good indicator. You better run from it. You got to guard your soul. You got to guard your greatness. You got to guard that promise that God put in you. You got to guard that destiny that God put in you. My God, I wonder if anybody believes what I'm preaching. 
you got to run from it because there's great things inside of you. There's greatness inside of you. And you don't want to compromise it with this world. You don't want to give it away in a place that you shouldn't be at. you got to run from some things in this world. But while you're running from stuff, don't just run anywhere. The Bible says follow after. The word follow means to run swiftly, to run after, to seek after eagerly, to earnestly endeavor to acquire. He says, here's what you got to follow. Here's what you got to chase after. Chase after righteousness. Chase after holy living. Chase after purity. Chase after righteousness. Lift your hand in heaven, to heaven and say, God, help me to chase after righteousness. Help me to pursue living holy. Help me to pursue clean living. Help me to pursue the kind of life you want me to live, God. He said, run after, run away from the lust of this world, but run after righteousness. Run after faith. The word faith is fidelity. It means faithfulness. That means you got to be accountable. You got to be able to be counted on. You got to be faithful. He said, run towards faithfulness. Run towards charity. Charity is love, brotherly kindness. It's love one for another and love for God. He said, run towards love and run towards peace. Peace is unity, togetherness. It's binding together. God, help me to run towards those things. If you want to be great, if you want to be great, the call is to learn, to filter your life, to live holy, and to keep yourself pure. Amen. Yet sandwiched in the middle of all of this is the verse I skipped, verse number 20. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor, and some to dishonor. We expect a great house to have vessels of gold and silver, don't we? Gold and silver are valuable, costly, precious. We expect a great house to have expensive vessels. But Paul reminded Timothy that a truly great house doesn't only have gold and silver, it also has wood and earth. Earth is clay, it's dirt, it's mud. A great house has vessels of honor and get vessels of dishonor. A truly great church will have people who are at all points in the process. A truly great church has room for people who aren't a finished product yet. They're not gold and silver just yet. They've still got a lot of dirt, clay, and mud, and wood in them. But you can't be a great house if you don't have people in process. A truly great church can have people come in the door bound by sin, and instead of us becoming like them, they become like us. People who are struggling that need to get their life together, there's room here for them. People who make mistakes and have faults and fail, there's room here for them. We can't be a great church without sinners in the pews. Woo! We can't be a great church without addicts coming to the house of God, without sinners coming to the house. We can't be great if people can't come and feel like they can be loved no matter what they're going through. God, let this be a great, it's a key to greatness. I want to be a great church. I want to be a great church. I want to be a great church. I said, I want to be a great church. That means I got to live holy. That means the ones on the inside got to get it together and live right and be faithful and be holy. But at the same time, don't forget that when people walk through that door needing God, there's room for them here. We can't be great if all we have are robots and imitators. We can't be great if there's not room for the person that has a broken life to come into the house of God. I've known some preachers who were glad they had no sinners in their church. I've heard them say things like, we're small, but we're clean. No, what you are is stupid. What you are is backslidden. You forgot that you're supposed to reach the world. You forgot that people need God and you're the ambassador. And if you don't want them in the house of God, you failed your people. A great house has room for people that need God. Oh, God. A great house has room for the broken, room for the hurting, room, room for the weak, room for the failure. A great house has room for people who have messed up, made mistakes, but they want to get right and they don't want to be lost. And so there's room in the great house for vessels of honor and dishonor. We can't be great without them. 
can't be great if we're not reaching for people who need God. The challenge we have is to live holy, but have room for the unholy. To live righteously, but have room for the unrighteous. To live godly, but have room for the ungodly. That, my brothers and sisters, is the key to a great house. I hope, I hope you're catching my burden. I hope you're catching what I'm saying right now. I'm calling the members of Bethlehem to higher living, but I'm also saying let's reach this world while we got a chance. Let's reach for everybody, for everybody that we can get to come. Let's reach for them. I'm preaching, God, don't let us become marred by the world, but help us allow people who are to find a place in the house of God. Mercy never goes out of style. Grace never goes out of style. We cannot get complacent. We cannot settle for average. We cannot let ordinary rule the day. The church was called to greatness in the kingdom of God. This church cannot have been called to greatness unless you, the members, were called to greatness. That means you, brother, and you, sister. That means you who feels like a failure. That means you who feels like you've messed up so bad you can't do anything for God. That means you who has so much stuff in your past that you don't see why God would care one little bit for you. That means you, the members of Bethlehem Church, have been called to greatness. That means you've got the powerful anointing of God in you. That means you're valuable and important and gifted. That means you're important in the house of God. That means we don't give up on people just because they have problems and trials and they mess up. We don't throw young people on the trash heap just because they make a mistake. We don't throw families out just because they've had a bad spell. We have room in the house. This is a great house, folks. I'm telling you, this, this is a great church. I'm not ashamed to say it. I'm not afraid to say it. This is a great church because we want to live for God, but we also want people who need God to come. You are the key to revival. You've got greatness inside of you. Why don't you stand and give somebody a high five and tell them how great they are? Come on, tell them. Huh? No, we're not just messing around. Tell them. Trevor, you got greatness in you. You hear me, son? Wiley, you got greatness in you. Wiley, you understand what I'm saying? There's greatness inside of you. Aaron, there's greatness inside of you. You hear me, Ava? God's got great things for your life. Don't settle for anything else. Brother Reggie, God's got great. I'm telling you, everybody in this church, we can't be a great house unless you got greatness in you. These pews aren't going to be great. you got to be great. That means you've got a promise. You've got a destiny. You've got a calling. You've got a gift. You've got an anointing. I'm in a church full of great people. I said, I'm in a church full of great people. Hey, somebody give God a great praise. You are the key to revival. You are the key to revival. You got greatness inside of you. Man, if there's ever been a night I'm glad I forgot to start my timer, this is the one. Listen, young parents, your job is to disciple your children. Teach them how to be faithful. Show them how to worship. You are the example. You are the key. You got greatness inside of you. You can raise great children. Your boys and girls can be great in the kingdom of God. They don't have to go to their 15 and backslide and then come back later. You have the key to greatness inside of you. You can be a great mom. You hear me? You hear me? There's some moms in this place. You think you're a failure. I'm telling you, you can be a great mom. You can be a great dad. Your house can be a place of revival. You got greatness inside of you. Let me tell you, young folks, it doesn't matter who talks about you and who doesn't like you. God likes you, and God loves you, and God believes in you. Why do you think you're in church tonight and there's millions of young people out there running the streets? It's because God saw something inside of you. He saw greatness. He saw greatness inside of you. 
We got great elders. We got great moms and dads. We got great grandparents. We got great young people and children. You're great because God called you. And God saw you were chosen by God. You got great. This is a great house, folks. Listen, middle-aged people like me. It's not time to relax and slack. It's not time to let somebody else do everything. It's not time to just sit back and let the young folks do it all. You got greatness inside of you. You got to keep using it. If you don't use it, you'll lose it. Time to be great. To our elders, we need you involved. You've not outlived your usefulness. You've not outlived your importance. This assembly can only achieve greatness if we all strive for greatness together. Man, I'm excited about the future of Bethlehem Church. I'm excited about what God's doing. I said I'm excited about what God's doing here. There's greatness in this place. Woo! Somebody ought to talk in tongues right now. Hey! Hey, I feel the winds of revival stir in this place. I feel the winds of revival shake in this house. Woo! <laughs> Somebody ought to just talk in tongues right now. Y'all ought to just forget about everybody around you. It ought to be a you and God moment right now. You ought to just let the great God plant a seed inside of your spirit that drives you to another level. Hey! Hey, Woo, come on. Hey, it's not time for average ordinary. We done kicked average and ordinary out of here. We've already kicked mediocre out of here. This is not the home for this is not the home for the enemy. Hey, a mom and dad ought to hold their hand up together in heaven and just claim victory over your home and victory for your family. A wife ought to throw her hands in heaven and begin to praise God and pray for a revival to hit her husband. Come on, men. It's time to go to another level. It's a great house. Brother Benny, there's greatness inside of you. Brother Stan, there's greatness inside of you. Sister Anna, there's greatness inside of you and greatness inside of what's inside of you. Brother Jamie, you got greatness in you, sir. Let me tell you, the past doesn't determine the future. You got greatness inside of you. The hand of God has been on you since you were a child. And though you tried to get away, God kept bringing you back. He didn't do it because you're a loser. He didn't do it because you're a failure. He did it because there's greatness inside of you. Craig Work, let me tell you, you're a soul winner, son. The Holy Ghost has determined that you got great potential and great power. The hand of God is on your life. Hey, somebody ought to just shout a little bit because you got a great God. Woo. I feel great things in store. I feel great things on the way. I feel great things on the way. I feel great things for your family. I feel great things for your children. I feel great things for your home. <laughs> Lay a hand on somebody close to you and just pray one for another. Woo! <laughs> there ought to be a great shout come up out of here. <laughs> Taylor, God's hand is on your life. You believe what I'm telling you? God's chosen because there's greatness for you. Don't let what anybody ever told you make you believe that you're not great in the eyes of God. It's why you're here. God's hand is on you. You hear me? God's hand is on your family. Woo! <laughs> oh, I feel great things in the atmosphere right now. Brother Ethan, I feel led of the Holy Ghost to pray for you. Amen. God's got a great blessing for you in Jesus' name. 
Reach a hand over to Brother Ethan. Hey. Release the greatness within him. Release the greatness within him, God. Release the greatness. God, I pray greatness on our children. God, on our little boys and little girls. God, I pray greatness on these little ones running around here. God, I pray greatness on these babies, on these young boys and girls. I pray greatness in their life. I rebuke the enemy off of them. I rebuke the spirit of this age off of them. I believe these children are going to grow up in the Holy Ghost to serve God. Yeah, 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 Victoria, the hand of God's on your life. You hear me? The hand of God is, there's greatness inside of you. There's great things for your life. There's great things for your future. Yeah, in Jesus' name. I wish somebody right now begin to pray great things over their children. Great things over their wife or husband. Great things over their parents. Great things over their church. We serve a great God of great things. Oh, come on. Hey, let's not have an ordinary altar service. What do you say? Why do you say we go ahead and just step on out and let the Holy Ghost begin to work? Begin to pray one for another and speak words of faith over each other. He's a great God. He's got a great church. And he's got great people. Because his mercy is great. His grace is great. His anointing is great. His love is great. His deliverance is great. His joy is great. His peace is great. JC, you got greatness in you, young lady. There's a great hand of God on your life. You hear me? I rebuke condemnation in the spirit of heaviness. Oh, God, let a restoring anointing of the Holy Ghost flow through this place. God, for the weak, for the wounded, for the weary, for the tired, for the tested, for the stressed. God, let a fresh wind of the Holy Ghost blow through this place on moms and dads and grandparents. God, let the fresh wind of the Holy Ghost bless these young people and children one more time. Oh, God, let a fresh anointing of great things come upon your people. I'm not going to let the past derail my destiny. God believes in you or you wouldn't be here. God has faith in you or you'd have been gone a long time ago. If God didn't think you had it in you, you wouldn't still be here. But through trials and tests and tribulations, he's brought you to this point because he knows there's great things in your life. Oh, yeah, 
that's right. Just be spirit-led praying for each other. Just be spirit-led ministering one to another. Mm. Ha, ha, ha. Woo, glory to God. I feel the great presence of the Lord in this place. I feel the great restoring anointing of the Spirit in this house. I'm reaching. I'm reaching for more. I'm pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling. I'm pressing upward. I'm pressing onward. I'm pushing myself. I'm reaching for great things. Woo! Glory! Glory!
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you.
God, we're reaching for you. God, we're reaching for more. God, we're reaching for great things. God, we're reaching for more.
Can we one more time lift our hands unto the Lord? Begin to worship Him right now. Thank Him for what He's done in this place. Lord God, we worship you. We thank you, God, for your goodness and mercy and grace. We thank you, God, for the greatness that you've put in us right now, God. We thank you, Jesus, for reminding us to be great, to not settle, oh God, for less. But thank you for showing us right now to move forward in you and move into a deeper place in you, Jesus. We've got great things, and God, we want to fulfill it. So God, with our hands up, we surrender to you right now. With our hands up, God, we surrender to you, to the call of God that we have on our lives. We surrender right now, Jesus. We believe in your word tonight, God, and we want to do whatever you've called us to do. We surrender right now in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Can we clap our hands unto God and give him a great shout of praise for what he has done tonight and what he's about to do Come on, shout one more time for what he's about to do. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Why don't we give the man of God with the word of God a hand clap tonight for obeying the Lord. If you're offended, you go take that before God. He preached the word of the Lord tonight. He preached the word of the Lord tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that you would instill this word in us, God. Let it be solid in our hearts, God. Let it not escape, but God, let it be sown into good ground that it would bring forth much fruit. In the name of Jesus, we pray it, and we believe your word tonight. We believe what you're going to do in our lives. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be dismissed in the name of the Lord.